Okay. Um, this can go in many ways. I'm happy for you guys to push it around. I just wanted to spend a tiny amount of time just saying what the physical web was, like literally just a few minutes, but explain the problem that we discovered and how I believe the indie web could possibly handle. I want to talk about the, the broader web problem more than the physical web. Okay. Um, so, I don't know if people are interested. So, uh, I went to uh, OS Bridge. Sure. And uh, one of the topics was like resiliency and like disaster recovery and like what could open source do for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the questions was like, what can you do with open hardware and like, yeah. you know, so that you can communicate with your neighbors or whatever, even if right. it's offline. Well, this during a disaster. Did, well, Mozilla just put up two million dollar bid for this, right? Right. Yes. Yesterday. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's a how do you communicate a disaster offline? But Mozilla not somebody else, right? But that's way past what I'm talking about, though. A very, it's a very different thing. Okay. Right. I mean, cool, cool topic. But so, um, so what I wanted, basically, what happens with the physical web is that we have these small little beacons that, that broadcast Bluetooth low energy. So it's a BLE beacon. And we, so as part of my work, we created a new beacon standard, again, up across from iBeacon, and it's, it's called Eddystone. And the Eddystone beacon standard just broadcasts URLs. And it's really literally a, a URL. And it's broadcasted over and over, and over again. Um, and and now there are other flavors of Eddystone, but for this conversation, I don't want to focus on that. This is not an Eddystone tutorial. I'm just saying that we got beacon, and, and whether it's a beacon or whether it's inside your toy, or it's inside your your car, or it's inside this, is is irrelevant. It's just a device is broadcasting URL. Your phone. Well, your phone can be a beacon as well. Absolutely. And then as you have more and more of these things all over the place, okay, what can happen is your phone can then be here, and it has a scanner that's listening to all these things. Um, we, have a, we have a chair over here. Do you want to or can you, you scoot over here? And then you want, you want to sneak around there? So we're, we're doing the hopefully five minute discussion of the physical web because we want to talk about the real issue about what it means for hardware and how the web can help. So your phone then basically looks for these beacons and then just provides a list. Nothing. Did you guys ever uh, prioritize the list? We, uh, we actually do prioritize the list. Is this is it? Is there string strength or what? Any of that is possible. Um, so, now, and now what happens is the very fact that you see all this hardware, and then you can see them by, is, is what makes people like so happy about the physical web. These are broadcasts in any web page you want. There's no central server of any kind. So this could be going to CNN.com, this could be going to mylostdog.com, this could be going to uh, my, my, my page at a conference, so people can see who I, who's there. So this is a lovely, crazy web richness that's being found here. However, here's the problem we discovered. If the phone is getting all these URLs, you've got two particular problems. One is, because Bluetooth has got such a short packet size, right, the URLs are very short. So you almost everyone goes through a shortness. Okay? With concretely? Concretely? We're going with 18 bytes. Now, but what we do is we, we use NDEF encoding, so we have things like .com slash and HTTPS, www dot as one byte. So big chunks of it can be pulled away. So effectively, you, if, if all you have is a domain, you can literally have two bytes for everything else, and then that gives you 16 bytes for your domain. If you want to put anything on the end, so we've got, there's a uh, Ruby tag, is a Finnish company who created a bunch of beacons that did a Kickstarter, and they have a URL which is like Ruby dot um, and then they just take all of the nine sensors, create a, uh, a compressed hash on the end of the URL, and every time they broadcast, they change that hash. So when you hit the website, you actually get all of the sensor values from the web page without ever connecting to the website, which just shows how awesome URLs are, right? <laughs> and so, um, you know, so, so people are doing really crazy stuff, but what it means is they're completely not human readable. What you want to see is coke.com or rubytag.com again. So first, and then the other thing, of course, is spam and malicious stuff. So what ends up happening, oh, sorry, stats, uh, we will call bad actors. And the other one is simply metadata. I want to have the favicon, I want to have the title, I want to have a snippet so the user can actually see what it is. 
So the first implementation that we did was we took every single URL and we hit every single website and we scraped it, which is ridiculous. Unbelievably slow, power hungry, no way. So what we ended up doing is we created what was called the PWS, the physical web service. And it was originally invented and visioned entirely as a cache. Just like, have you seen this before? Give it back to us. You give it a URL, it gives you a tuple back, okay? And it was awesome. It was fast, it was quick, and it solved all these problems. And then once we had the PWS, we could start filtering out bad sites. We could, for example, Chrome insisted that we we don't support, we just completely filter out HTTP sites because they're not considered to be secure. Chrome really pushes HTTPS. I'm not saying to agree with that. That was, just, that was a policy decision that was made. So we filtered out HTTP, which, by the way, got rid of the vast majority of phishing sites. And then we can do things like, like ranking, right? And we started off by doing distance ranking because we have some signal strength and things like that. So, however, I'm trying to be done with the physical web and bring this to indie web. What we discovered was we created a monster. And here's essentially the problem, is that we, the web is so open, and because the phone is now saying, this is what I found, from Google's point of view, the physical web is no longer a scanner, but a recommendation engine. It's like, this is what I found, this is what I filtered, and we were seeing site, people were putting up porn sites, or people were putting up spam or, I mean, bad malicious sites, and we were offering it to them. So instead of just simply being a URL on the wall that you typed in, it was now something that popped up. And so Google was now in the position of validating invalid sites. And it just completely freaked them out. So the physical web is still there, but we are now effectively cranking up the ranking. And if what happens is if nobody clicks on it or people push it away and dismiss it, we, we stop showing it. We're trying to be very proactive with that. Not exactly encouraging development, right? So there's, and, and not only that, it's kind of something that only a Google or a you know, Microsoft can do because you need a huge database of quality and tracking and so forth. So we have now, the whole purpose of the physical web was to be completely decentralized. Right. And what we created, something that is completely centralized. So, so you, know, you could have basically done without the beacons, just use GPS information and the big database in the sky and produce the same thing. <laughs> well, that's, that's for things that don't move. But like people love the lost dog example, right? right. They, on the, the dog yeah, call yeah, and that kind of stuff. And so that kind of stuff. So the sphere of the physical web, I think, is still alive and well. People like it. But I was really intrigued with your um, social network talk this morning and as one possible example. So the question I was thinking is, if we want, I think there's two ways to go. One is we just simply go with another company or another independent person that says, I don't care. Here's what I find, and it's okay. We just basically go with someone who doesn't care that you should service porn sites. You just basically just define the problem away. Or we come up with some type of. Well, well, I think there's a use case that you only want to see porn sites as a Thank you for that very useful comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. I would like to think that, here's my provocation, is if we believe in the open web, a thousand flowers should bloom, and one man's spam is another person's gold, right? How do you, and, and honestly, to make it even worse, there were really good companies that were saying 50% off coupons, and everybody hated those. So even though it was a totally valid site, and you could find all the Realme links to prove that they're valid, people still hated them. So this is a bit, very much a slippery slope. All I'm saying is, if we could at least have a mechanism of getting rid of the worst actors, this would significantly increase the perception of this, and it would allow us to encourage this indie web for hardware. So did, and that was my question. Did, did you try, um, instead of having Google and ICU filter, um, make this sort of a point where an app could come in? You know, where it could basically download some app from somewhere, and that had its own filtering mechanism, and it would filter according to whatever that Absolutely. was? Absolutely. And that's exactly the same thing that you do with PWAs. With progressive web apps, you can use Bluetooth to scan for your own beacons. So as long as you're willing to download an app for your use case, this problem goes away. But it's not necessarily for my use case, but for my value system. So, so you know, I might say, how Google is great at filtering stuff. You know, I just take what you just described, but now I'm in the process of figuring out um, doing those open source science research about where the porn uh, is in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. In which case, the, the filter I want is I want only the porn, <laughs> nothing else, right? So I get an app that does that. I mean, I think if you have a healthy ecosystem, you can build any kind of scanner you wish. 
part of the problem is we're trying to build an ecosystem to begin with. And so the ecosystem was basically getting cut off at the knees before we even got started. Because unfortunately, this type of security phishing is why we can't have nice things, right? Because there's too many bad actors out there. And so part of me is really, I have two very different minds here. I'm the kind of person that believes in the original web, and I actually don't mind if I see an occasional bad site. That's just the way the web works. Mm -hmm. So part of me feels like this is Google's problem. This isn't our problem to solve. The other one is to say, can the indie web, with its social networks or its link system, or whatever, actually come up with a mechanism to say, guess what? This site's got enough weight that it's actually okay to show. And that's the challenge I'm asking for well, you guys. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, of course, there's a difference between a bad site coming up when you click on a link actively versus a notification popping up on your phone letting you, hey, go here, and this right. sucks. Well, actually, so the, the, that's one thing that we talked about, which is only the really great sites would do notifications, and then the, 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 then the list would show everything else. So you're right, that would help. Yeah, so the um, spam or kind of, uh, reputation trust uh, algorithms that's important in England right now is a thing called Vouch. Uh, it's basically web trust. Uh, so, so, someone writing this down? Yeah, it's on there, so it's uh, not on it's called Vouch. Um, it is, it's basically web of trust, just using you know, any web link, I, you know, especially that marked up, you know, reply, like whatever. Um, it's similar to what I do with that for you basically, you check if you have been ever linked to this person or from this person yet, and you can walk that. Um, it's totally unproven. So this is the proposed spam filter for web mentions. Um, to this point, we believe we have never seen a native web mention spam. We will at some point, but we have not seen one yet. And so there has been you know, a lot of kind of theoretical work on Bash. I think one or two implementations. Very little actual work because it's not a problem in practice yet. But there. Do, do, do a talk on Bash at DEF CON. You'll get some spam and worse. I remember back in the identity days, when I, on my blog, had the first uh, spam comment authenticated with Almighty. Uh, that is a must. Yes, it is. It totally is. <laughs> <It's laughs> <very important. laughs> so that's the thing. Um, so, I mean, so I'm curious about uh, so, so like the Atom Entity Web is personal a personal website. Right. What is the corresponding? Like, I, I get that the Atom in, in physical web is you know an object like a, a device that's broadcasting. All these. Right. What do you think the like the uh, indie web atom in? I don't think that it is. It, the, the device itself is not really important. The physical atom. What is the okay. is the destination that it sends you to? Sure, but then that's just a website. So then the question is: Is there a corresponding physical web atom, or is it just like the physical web atom is the it's broadcasting it's device? It's a particular URL. Well, what we what we've seen is two categories. Two the two broadest categories of of physical web beacons to date have been a company slash store number, yeah. like this McDonald's, mm -hmm. right? Or an uh, 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 electronics company slash model number slash serial number. So it would, it's a URL for that device or a URL for that store. So it's usually based off of their domain. And I would argue we could possibly have two types of, we could hit the domain and see how reputable the domain is, and then we could hit the URL, I mean, this is the full URL, and possibly talk about two different levels of drugs. Uh, Scott, I apologize if we covered this already, but if you could just explain briefly, like in 10 or 15 seconds, you know, what is the physical web and what is it for? That's what this was, discussion was here, okay. which is basically any stone beacons, this is the standard that we created, which is a Bluetooth low energy beacon right. that broadcasts a URL, and then whether it's in a device or whether it's in a beacon is kind of irrelevant. You know, we want these to be in Happy Meal toys, we want these to be in okay. museums and so forth. And then once you have a, a range of these things, your phone scans for them, sees those raw URLs, and presents human readable lists. Okay. So what if, what if it required human interaction to, like, like for example, if you were in a museum or something, what if you had to press a button on a display in order for it to send the URL? Yeah, yeah. and so th there's, there's certainly the fact that by using the notification route, we upped the, the intensity of Google being a recommender. If we, but at the same time, what we, when you talk to deployers, if you ask people to push a button, then nobody sees anything and nobody gets excited. So there's that fine line between okay. having it. Now, honestly, in the short term, we could. I'll see your phone doesn't know that you pushed the button anyway. Well, and there is, on, on Android, there is something called Nearby, which is a little diamond icon, which you'll see on, on your Android phone. And if you go to Nearby and you put it on your desktop, when you click on it, we will show you the things around you. And we show everything. We're, we, will, we will not notify on everything. But I guess my point, though, is any time you decide to sometimes notify, sometimes not notify, you've created this beast. 
I mean, the very thing I despise, I created. And that's, and that's what makes me so sad, right? Well, it, it seems to me that, that at the same time, by tying uh, a physical thing mm -hmm. that's going to last mm -hmm. to something as transient as a website mm -hmm. that has to be renewed routinely, mm -hmm. you know, is, is just cursed physical things with the transient nature of the web. The alternative that was being proposed before the physical web was to put an iBeacon in it and have an application. And in fact, the physical web was a response to that assumed default solution, which was for every category of smart device out there, I do install a unique app for it. So that was solution A. Solution B is the physical web, which is to say, use the web to not make me pre-install a thousand applications to get a thousand devices. It's also a very, but, very loose coupling, right? I mean, the website has its own full life without the beacon. The beacon could reprogram point to a different website. I mean, it's, it's not much of a dependence. It just happens to be to point to it for a while, right? Uh, tell me about more about how you reprogram all these devices. I am sure you can. But, but, I'm sure you can. You, you well, just had a great example where, they, where every time it had a different recording, it had a different URL. Yeah. Right. That's right. the extreme case. That's where the, extreme the, case. The, the, the URL is not the same twice. Ago. And one one company was doing uh, timestamps that were encoded in their own yes, way, yes. so that they would know that when you hit that URL, you were actually there. You know, so, so, so it seems to me one thing to do is, is not be so radically efficient and just output something in ASCII that a human could read. And 18 bytes. Well, and, and by the way, yeah, what now, what, uh, like, like we're saying that for 100 years of development of radio, that we're now limited to 18 bytes. But, well, no, I think the efficiency is the problem. That is the issue. And by the way, BLE5, it'll be 128 bytes. So in a very short period of time, that problem will go away. The issue is, it's just isn't encoding. Even if you have bytes and it says Coke, how do you know it's, how do you relate that to an experience? Well, this is like printing. You know, you can print the label and stick it on there and people can read it. So you are, that's what you're competing with in a sense. I mean, other than that, it's just gizmos. I'm not sure you understand the value of having that. You explain your, uh, your bike case from the oh, well, earlier. So here's the case where QR codes show the possibility. In, in China, you use WeChat to pay for things. So there's a QR code on bikes, and you do it. It takes 35 bucks off of your credit card. You bicycle a mile, and you scan it again, and it goes, oh, you used a, a, a bucks worth. It puts $34 back on, right? $35 is the cost of a bike in China. So that's the worst case if you steal the bike, right? So that was working fine, and then some bright spark came along and put fake QR codes on, on a few bikes, take the $35, and then never give it back to you again. And they made a mint, right? So that's the worst case scenario is that you go into Bank of America, you're in Bank of America, and it says, hey, Bank of America, they don't have beacons. Somebody put one there, and you go, this must be safe. I'm in Bank of America. You click on it, and it asks for your password, and you're, you're gone. So it is as dangerous as the web. Yeah, and it's actually more dangerous because more spammable. It's actually mm -hmm. easy, it's possibly easier to fish because, or there is maybe more inherent or automatic trust in the physical world. So yeah, so we haven't learned to be distrustful in the physical world like we have on the web. Scott, I want to go back to my question. When I asked what um, the physical web is, I wasn't really asking you know, like what components is it built from, but I mean like what what is the purpose of it? What does it do? What is it for? The purpose of the physical web was to counter the existing trend to have a range of smart devices that could only be controlled with individual pre-installed okay. applications. That's the thing you're trying to do. It turned out to be so generic that people were using it for museums, they were using it for vending machines, lost dogs. Uh, people were actually using it at conferences to find each other. Yeah. And we even had someone talking about the fact that they wanted to do meta tags to include audio things so that they could do navigation for the blind. And then they would build a custom physical web browser, and I was like, "This is awesome because this is the kind. This is why the web, this is why the web is amazing. You could write a custom physical web scanner to pick up custom meta tags to do things you had never envisioned before." So, would you like us to help think about the hosting problem, or would you like us to think about how to connect indie web and physical web, or both? I think, in general, I just a wanted to point out this issue and to see what the indie web had to say about it, and I had hoped that the indie web could have a mechanism for us to help have more meta information in a federated way. Yeah. That, that was my original lesson. If there's more to talk about, that'd be great. Can I throw a straw man? No, I'm sure that it. So it seems to me what we're building in IndieWeb, among many other things, is essentially a circle graph of some kind. 
where we write. Mm -hmm. I talk to you, you talk to me. We have certain weights on the edges, and we can tell exactly what the, the, the vector is that sits on there. But there's some weights for those things. Let's assume for a second that it is not just between people, but it is also between people and organizations, uh, right? Because I might have liked Coke, right? Or stuff like that. So now I have this graph, and it's a decentralized graph because my view of the graph is locally at my site, right? Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no general God's view of what this is unless you come in and you scrape everything, um, mm -hmm. right? Now, so it, it appears to me that if I walked into this room, for example, and the expectation was that each one of us brought a beacon to advertise their blog, which would be a, a good use case. Yes, yes absolutely. Okay. Then, um, and they'd say, you are the bad guy in here, and you advertise something very awful. Then it seems to me, given the social network that we are part of, yeah. um, I can do quite good filtering as to who's most likely going to be the bad guy. Yeah, so vouch, just based on links, it's like, uh, it links so paid rank instead of PGP two signatures. It's right, right, well, yeah, yeah. there's different levels of technology you can apply to this. Just the fact that you commented on my blog once is already a vouch of some kind. Yeah. 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 It's literally about it. Well, just so you know, everything we've done is open source. We have an open source beacon image, we have an open source scanner, and we have an open source PWS. Oh. Now, now the PW, it's all at, 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 at our GitHub. Okay. So for example, our PWS is actually pretty stupid. It just literally Caches those tuples and returns them to me, but it's actually not that hard to do, right? If we were to do nothing more than integrate Vouch into that, so that it comes back ranked, and we could put, say, things that Vouch vouches for, and things that we could actually put. So that my my my, my, my particular uh, algorithm for uh, for criminal the rank, right, is very specific to me. Right. Because it, 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 it starts with me as the root of right. that social network, right? If you know, right, was, was not going to do it, it was it was going to be look different because you have different social relationships than I have. Right? Yeah. Which I think would be actually the one the thing I actually want. Because you might like Coke and I might not. And uh, so therefore you want to see the Coke bacons and I don't. Well here, here's another example that motivated. I felt so bad with the way Google was doing it that if you were to walk into Maker Fair, mm -hmm. everything would get filtered. Because right. nothing had been seen before, so we wouldn't trust it. <laughs> and so, therefore, you get no notifications. Uh -huh. And I thought that was like exactly the wrong way of doing it. And whereas using your model, you're implying that if there's somebody at Maker Fair that I know is part of my tree, these things sort of percolate up. Exactly. Well, except, except right. to, to give an exa example, um, you know, the Hackerspace Noise Bridge had a table at Maker Fair, so people at Noise Bridge would vouch for that, and they would vouch for the, you know, the the table next door that they had seen, and, and, that would, and, and so I think that would percolate out. Well, that's why I want to think, I actually want to think big. I want a PWS that's actually pretty monstrously large that we can actually talk about open sourcing this. Business. I want to basically take this away from Google, is what I want to do. Right, it's good to I mean, if you have one gigantic monster, you know, if somebody else owns the monster, it's still a monster. <laughs> it's open well, source. We federate it, right? So if it, okay, if it's federated, <coughs> but I would like well, more federated down to every single person. So right. that, if, if, we, if we can get there someday. But my, my first step was to say, what short-term steps can we take to provide a better version that we currently have, and then encourage other scanners? There's a related problem, uh, which I've been pondering a little, which is basically in my news feed, okay? Uh, everybody has way too much information coming in, it's very difficult to filter. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, and uh, the way I'd like to filter is very similar to this one. I'd like to filter by my social network, because the kind of people that I want to hear from are mm -hmm. in my social network. Right. The ones that are not my social network, I probably don't want to hear from, unless there is some recommendation that comes in. Right. And uh, ultimately, I'd like to have a news feed that is prioritized and I'm thinking of something that has a the difference between where it shows up in the feed and in the ranking, but also sort of the font size. Mm -hmm. well, okay. but I, and I with the, or the contrast. Are you familiar with Little Bird? Uh, Little Bird was, is, a, is a guy that, he basically built this where you yeah, basically, right. he pulls all your feeds and ranks them. R right, and so, but if you look like how it would rank them, then it is the same algorithm fundamentally. You, you go from your own location in the social graph, you have certain weights among them, you aggregate them because I'm hitting you, you know, three yeah. different avenues. And I think uh, what then shows up in my news feed is very similar, but well, it's actually identical to this list of uh, beacons. Another funny thing is Facebook does it. Yeah. Or so they Both say. implicitly and explicitly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so they say here. Yeah, it's just that oh, they sure. think they do, they do this because they have the overarching interest yeah. of selling me something. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't say anything about motivations or verifiability, right. but you can.
Yeah, I expect, and they do say that they do do this both based on the implicit, your implicit actions, mm -hmm. and your explicit like follow, unfollow friends, strong friends, etc. So yeah. Well, and I, maybe I was overthinking it, but I felt like if we solve this general ranking problem that the physical web exposed it might be of use mm -hmm. to other parts of the indie web, which is to say for spam, for comments, for other things, because this, it felt like as a generalizable problem. I have a whole bunch of stuff, what do I think about it? So you, I can, you know, you could do both. So I think one interesting feature of um, ad blocking software is lots of people publish filter, like uh, lists of filters, mm -hmm. like, I don't like these ads, I don't like these ads, that kind of thing. Um, and there's a you know, directory or marketplace where you can go choose the one you like, right? It allows porn or it doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Google is one of the few organizations that can run the engine for this, has enough metadata to, to you know, check malware, et cetera, et cetera. But you could imagine similar crowdsourced lists of like, I want to see these kinds of things, I don't want to see these kinds of things. Like I have, here are my thresholds for sort of filtering different kind of like dangerous versus spam versus porn, you know? Yeah, right. So I don't know. Well, it just felt like it, I don't want us to not consider it if it's too big of a problem. I really wanted to figure out what the right problem was, because honestly, five years from now, I think it will be a more tractable problem. So let's just start thinking about it, the right way so to solve what it. What are you looking for with your, you know, uh, I mean, you're probably doing a session with your individual hat on, but what would be the best sort of outcome in general for you? The best some kind of project people start writing code that is going to produce them. Well, there's there's the best personal outcome for me, and then there's what I hope is the best personal outcome for the EU web, which I think are related to separate. I would really want to make a completely usable open source version of the PWS that can be federated that will allow the physical web to truly be independent. However, as I said before, I believe it's the exact same thing. Just because it's the physical web is for hardware doesn't mean it doesn't apply to people. Right. And I would argue that this ranking mechanism seems insanely valuable to everything that we do. And so therefore, I think it would be useful for, like, let's say you get a lot of comments, you want to rank them, you want to get rid of bad ones, if you part of a, a spam filtering system. So it strikes me as this idea of building a social network enhanced reputation that type of thing seems like a generic problem the indie web could start to tackle, even though like your social crawl, it'll be really a baby thing for three years. But at least we get started and we start thinking about it, we start building mechanisms for it. I think that would be an absolutely awesome thing for us. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm still having a little trouble because uh, you said that you're trying to solve the problem of making a universal translator that will take 18 bytes and turn it into something worth reading. Today, tomorrow we'll have 128 bytes. 128 bytes. Right. Maybe even a K later after, mm -hmm. you know, who knows. But but it's the universality of it. And the way you're going to get universality is to trust the domain name system. I, I would say, I just I think URLs are a good backbone and they've worked. I'm basing on URLs. Okay. Okay. And URLs. And, and that, uh, on the other hand, if it were easy to share encodings, if I could say, you know, if you go down up to Seattle, you know, here's a, a museum encoding, why don't you just take this encoding and then you'll, you'll see more. You know, we could pay, in other words, make it, instead of a push, mm -hmm. you know, instead of these devices pushing mm -hmm. to me, let's make it pull. And you said, well, it was pulled because you had to install an application. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's just too hard to install an application. Mm -hmm. Maybe an encoding could be 60 bytes, mm -hmm. you know, and float around among friends. Well, if you're talking about vouch, isn't that really just, you know, something like that? It's something that's shared. But, but the, you know, just because an application is hard to share doesn't mean that you can't I'm you know, not sort of sure that you would say it was you. You all didn't like that they were how proprietary it was. Well, in fact, let me give you the follow-on. The web VR team at Google. I don't think I'm giving away too much. By all. I'm talking about the fact that we have a VR team and we have an augmented reality team and so right. But, but, but yeah, yeah. But but the team there's there's actually a team that's working with you know bringing uh, augmented reality to headsets. They love the physical web oh, yeah. because. They want to be able to walk into any museum or anything and just expand whatever you're looking at expands in place. And they mostly just want content. Okay. And what they love about it is that you don't have to reinvent or get agreement on a new encoding system. 
it's literally a URL that just points you to, to some text and you just display it. On account of it's worked so poorly for English. No, so, okay, I think you both are talking about different subjects. I think so. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I give me a take an exam case. Uh, yeah. ER, uh, this is a great one. Let's say I put my ER goggles on or my yeah. phone, I walk in the museum and I stand in front of the Mona Lisa, uh -huh. right? What the positive use case would be that in my phone it has a little icon or something, it's happened and it tells me when the Mona Lisa was painted. Right. right? So, However, the negative use case was that that prankster walked in and put in a beacon right next to it, and when I click on it, you get a bunch of Mona Lisa porn. No, no, no. That's, right? that's, that's the use case. And you're trying to have the information about the Mona Lisa painting and not the one about the porn. And so, and that's why it's independent of the encoding, because the person could also have an encoded, using your system, encoded pointer to like the wrong stuff. If they want to. Yeah. Uh, so once, uh, once this goes to 128 bytes, uh, what about having digital signatures? What problem are you trying to solve? Um, uh, validating whether uh, whether the input you're getting is uh, from a trusted source. Well, we mentioned that today that there's digital signatures are awesome, but the point is it doesn't validate it. In other words, a bad guy can digitally sign something just as easily. Right, as a bad guy. but with a different key. Right, right. But you well, don't you have to, see, see, that database yeah. is the database of good keys. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, and this is where either centralized PWS or something like DNS, like anything you know, where there is some authority uh, that works. Um, you know, the authorities have problems with ways, but you know there is a limited number of ways to do authorities who will back for people. And so, for for example, here's the thought: so you walk into the museum, and uh, at the, the same place you buy your ticket, there's a spot you push a button, and the moment you push it, it sends the beacon. Uh, and so you should, the moment it does that, you should see the notification on your phone. That will give you, like, that clues you into which key is the real one. And if there was some pirate key, then it right. wouldn't know when you pushed the button. Yeah, let's learn here. I'm a guy, and I'm the world's best uh, expert on the Mona Lisa and paintings like it, except that the Louvre head hates me. I'd like to put my beacons there too, uh, except for some reason I can't anymore. Well, if it's, I, mean, I don't think I don't think you're entitled to drop just go dropping beacons in somebody else's museum. And also, keep in mind that the treating this as if it were a human level thing that takes you to a web page is really the V1 version of this. Where this really takes off is where we can start to have other devices pick up other things and you can start to harvest the stuff. So you can imagine, for example, seeing all the devices in my house. And not only do I get a web page, but I get JSON blobs. So I can then see all the characteristics of these devices and say, oh, look, I got 18 new light bulbs. Let's configure them. And so this quickly becomes a machine to machine protocol through JSON blobs. And if each one requires a button push to get a key, it's like it, Nirvana to me is I just get something I can trust in. Well, that, that's, yeah. that's just for, for getting on board the system at all. Once, it, it, that's how the web of trust works, is you might. Um, to create an initial link, you, you need some kind of personal contact. But once there's a chain of links, then you don't need to do that anymore. Well, actually, that's someone had talked about the fact, like, could we follow the cert model? Which is to say there are seven or, well, I know, I know, but like, there's a, there, there are X number of trusted entities. And there can be more, so therefore we, don't, we can federate it. And these devices all are certified by one of these entities. And uh, and, if, and then we just keep track of how many bad actors there are. And as soon as one cert authority has more than X percent bad actors, we just stop trusting them. So I have to say something on the subject of certs. If anybody believes certs are good, go into your browser and read each one of our root certificates and try to figure out who that is. And after you have gone down 300 or whatever the number is on the list, you will believe there is absolutely no reason to believe whatsoever that any of those are trustworthy. Well, and so, I mean, and so how, many, how many of those are not compromised by state actors? Well, there is, in every default version of uh, Firefox, there is some strange Turkish certificates of origin that I've never heard of and have no reason to believe that it exists. So then Mozilla does actually actively um, kick out uh, bad certificate um, authorities. So, so, so I mean, for it's for trust in the internet yeah. or any large scale truth system like this, I mean, I think we maybe know three ways to do it, right? right. And, and, is there more I'd love to hear? So yeah. one is authorities, and CAs for CLC has self big certificates. One is web of trust in various forms. One, maybe modern, kind of much less technical way is user reviews, right? Mm -hmm. And that again, often there is some authority, but it's a different system. Are those the main three we know that work at very large scale? Do we know of others, or does that cover them? The, the social graph. 
starting with this. That's what we yeah. That, that's what we trust. That seems like a good cut somewhere. Okay, and maybe two and a half, the user reviews thing, maybe it still depends on authority. So, right, right. I mean, there's also um, what, what we haven't talked about, mm -hmm. um, and maybe you've been researching it, maybe not, but if not, you should probably, is combining this, uh, this with a decentralized blockchain, because then, like, when you have a smart contract, you don't need, like, a ring of authorities or something. Anyone can just have a transaction and basically add their vouch to that um, object. For example, if you just have a, uh, if you just have a contract ID on, like, the hearing. Um, and that way it's completely trustless and we don't need to do any requests other than well, checking the Ethereum. Blockchain might be overkill. I love blockchain. It solves that will spend. It solves kind of verified right. computability. I don't know that it actually solves trust. trust. And and anybody can get a blockchain. Yeah. And if you yeah, don't have yeah, double so that you can trust block. not verification. They're not like so, so spend that kind of thing. Right? And, and, and the, yeah, but you can embed that too in the contract. Like you can, I don't think so. And pr proof of work is a high price to pay if you don't actually have a double spend problem. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, so, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Is in this community would there be a sufficient number of people who would be interested in building essentially an indie web of trust in a way that becomes a general purpose service for all sorts of applications and features yeah. included? Yeah, the people who have worked on that. And keep in mind, yes, I like to rephrase it. I just want to have a web of trust for URLs. Beacons is just a delivery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the physical web, like I said, the physical web was a gateway to this problem. I right. want to put the physical web and stop talking about it. It's really about having some validation for URLs. And that's what drove me to talk to you guys about yeah. because, frankly, if we were to do this, especially if in, uh, what the physical web could do is to say, I'm only going to show you things that have positive indications. Everything that's neutral will just be in a folder. I have to dig it out. That might, that's just one way of solving the problem, and therefore I only will show positive things. And so, and again, so we can cut, cut we can cover both ends, or I can only show you things that don't have negative values. So again, I think we have to encourage multiple solutions to this problem. So it, what we would start though is with how do we create a web? And then what we do with that web, I think frankly is quite varied and will encourage multiple solutions. Right. So separate the two out. So if I had, for example, an API on my website, um, in which I could basically, uh, some piece of code could ask the following question, um, given this URL, how much should I trust it? That comes back as a score. And for instance, right? Now the, the, the implementation underneath that basically goes like this, and this is very inefficient, it can be optimized, but for all of the contacts that I have for I mean, my social graph, ask the same question. Yeah. And then, you know, and then aggregate them by some kind of rating that I have for each one of them. Yeah. If I had that, right, then basically I could have my phone point to my own personal API on my website and say, I just found this beacon, yes or no, and it says point 0.9. Mm -hmm. So then, to your question of wanting this kind of thing at large data, like, I don't think we have ever seen a, you know, truly decentralized user product or truly decentralized web but one across anything ever adopted at truly large scale, right? right? And so the two options we have that are flawed, centralized, you know, centralized, yeah. but functional at large scale, decentralized, but you know, lots of small scale islands maybe. Because we can do this now. Yeah. But it only serves small wow. tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, can of thousands of billions. But it serves some communities. See, see, it doesn't have to serve everything at the same time. If you co cover all the people who have um, season tickets to the moon, you have critical mass in this particular market. Okay. Well, how would you? I, 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 I don't know. That's just something I was talking about. But uh, the, one can bootstrap something, but you know, very specific targeting a particular market, which is why the, why the indie web you know has a community that works. Well, it's very very specific. Why <laughs> rephrase it then? Let me postulate a very dumb idea to see if we can build on it, which is to say, what happens if I contact this website and it says who? Validates you, and you just responds back. Oh, here's the here's the price. Of, here's the realme links that, that validate me. Mm -hmm. Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Well, we will assign values to them. But at least somebody validates me. Step one, and step two, you could evaluate the evaluators, and then again, and you would return no more than a dozen or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would we think about it. Would we be able to then use that data to then? Because what may come of that is a natural evolution of. Who are the most valid validators? Yeah, so this is page rank effectively. Yeah. We have we have seen many good implementations that are centralized. Yeah, we don't I mean I, I don't know that we've yet seen an implementation of this that is decentralized 
it actually works at large scale, low latency, etc. That's a really this is this is big. I mean, yeah, these are fundamentally hard problems, and we have seen big centralized solutions and kind of small island decentralized ones, but not both. Oh. So I think what you just described is, is, is a more efficient version of what I described earlier. Okay. Here I am, I am, that's what I know, and I know my friends, and I encounter this beacon over here. Uh -huh. But I'm really trying to figure out what's the graph over here, yeah. right? The, the closer it is, the stronger the relationship is, the broader it also is, the more people refer to it, right. the better it is. What you just said, let's, come, uh, let's traverse the graph this way. So give me the ones that vouch for you. Yeah. What I'm really trying to figure out was what, what are the relationships, you know, there might be so many uh, relationships in between. But what I really want to do is the sum of all of these uh, edges. Right. And then, but, but what you're saying is it's really difficult to do in a decentralized fashion. But it's At large scale. Yes, but it's just an efficiency problem. Right? This is not a... It is so big that it, it almost goes from quantitative to qualitative. Oh, right. But uh, I think it's, there, there's two steps in a, in a solution approach. One of which is, is it possible in principle? And I think you say it is possible in principle. Principle. Now the only question is, can we afford it? Uh, also, it only solves half. Like, if we want just a pure reputation question, like how how absolutely trustworthy is this site? It gives us that. And, uh, and can it be spammed? Or can yes. it? Be, yeah. Can, so let's just say a Chinese farm comes in and they all point to each other or because you could argue for example what we do right now is everybody who swipes it away and doesn't visit actually gets a small negative mark as well yes. so you can imagine a gigantic Chinese farm coming in and just swiping everything away and like killing things too but, but see right. in, my, in, my, in, in this graph that doesn't actually really happen very much it just cost you a little bit of cred to, to neg something uh, then you'd actually you're right actually you you put it here's, here's the hostile beacon here's, yeah. here's the hostile beacon right and the yeah. Chinese farm comes in and he puts a ton of positive endorsements all around right right, right. but there's no connection in that graph right it's it's only them right so the, the trick is that these guys here have to somehow come over here yeah. right mm -hmm. and as soon as well, not over here more like over here okay but as soon as you have some history that this guy here keeps falling for the fake news yeah. you're going to volume down because he always falls for the fake news right. Right. this is page rank this is search quality yes. and it all works um, the main missing part right yeah. now is the me for you know, large scale because people, you know, that's where people don't, so don't have personal websites. And so you can, you can score you know, sites with the, you know, with the central system to big enough. Um, right. We don't have the personalized ranking yet uh, unless you go find another centralized thing like Facebook, which then you actually have the connection between people and sites. So what if you brought these things together? Going back to you were saying that you already have that in brown up there. Yeah. What about um, sort of what the what the Mozilla Persona did um, quite well? This integration of you should really have your own identity, but most in most cases you don't. So we are going to be you know your supplicant for that, and we're going to do it for you. If he basically architecturally said everybody has to have their own website, however if they don't, there is this proxy service operated by Google mm -hmm. that does it. And all of a sudden, the scalability problem is a lot easier because much of it is sitting up there. Yeah, and this is what we're saying. You know, the decentralized stuff. We have broadly, we don't, we have not yet seen a large scale decentralized one. Uh, the centralized stuff we have, and so you know, you, you kind of do the hybrid. I mean, Facebook is that right. proxy. Facebook is the thing we have that is a social graph with both you know, websites, companies, whatever, and people. Yeah. It's centralized. It's and problem. we did talk about the fact that Google would have to build the first one, and then we would open up the API and let other people come in. But it's just that we discovered that it was getting bigger and harder for other people to build. And one more common thing I'd let you know is uh, the unintended consequence of how this becomes an N squared problem yeah. is that this metadata, the first thing that deployers want is dynamic metadata. So the perfect example here is a, is a, uh, a, a, a bus company. So when you hit it, it says coming in three minutes, coming in two minutes, coming in one minute. So there, we initially had a cache of 15 minutes, and they were complaining about it. <laughs> so what they effectively want is if, if the whole world does this, they want to have an instantaneous up to the minute cache of the entire web, which of course becomes completely insane. Right. So, so there is this problem of freshness, which we have to be careful of. I'm willing, from a trust graph point of view, to give a 24-hour window, or even even, even a, a 10-day window if necessary. All, all I'm letting you know is this is another hole that we fell into, which was you really can create an infinite cache. Um, but that being said, hope I didn't distress anybody. 
I do feel like if we still can come up with an open source version of this that kind of sort of works not at scale, it at least it gets people talking and thinking about what are the ways we can trim the tree, what are the ways we can improve the problem, and so forth. Um, and you said it's open source. What is this? If you just go to uh, physical-web.org, and one of the links will point to our GitHub, and, and then our GitHub has all of it. Yeah, you should look at it. Um, email deliverability. So. Uh, kind of become domain keys, but more like the, the um, all right, um, so uh, like email realistic. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, uh, try to phrase it right. Um, they do these, there, there are a number of Tool like open source projects and tools and you know gray lists with different scores of kind of reputation for different domains and so lots of uh, uh, IT shops and people that run email servers both mm -hmm. coming out going out use these to determine whether to forward email on or drop it or market spam to forward it on with you know with a warning that kind of thing and yeah you know, it's, it's a lot of open source tools and data sets um, yeah. it's email ability it's a target but. Yeah, it's an example. That specific server there, um, where is that? If you look underneath, uh, I'll, I'll point it to you. It's, okay. it's, I'll, I'll navigate there. It's, it's okay. there somewhere. I think if you look for yeah, it, it is a web service or something. The uh, It's actually a very simple Google apps or, uh, Google domain apps thing. It's a Python script about 20 lines long. It's really not that big. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I was looking for something bigger. Um, maybe I found it already. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty small. Um, the other possibility would be just, again, part of me wants to understand just the size of the problem, the way of doing it, and like one possibility would be to say, guess what? Actually, we just need to pay somebody for it. We just need to create a new, you know, and then we, when we can have hundreds, we can have 200 of these servers, that, that, and then each one will point to someone, and then, and then they, they themselves get their own rank over time, and we trust them, and don't trust them, and we just fob it off on them, and then people will pay into this. Is, I, that sounds terrible. No, that's it. Yeah. So that's the other way of doing it. So, it just it just strikes me as a the bottom line of the web is that there it is completely blind and everything is a leap of faith and I'm amazed we've gotten this far <laughs> and 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 this is also what the Internet of Things is about because the Internet of Things wants to basically have these blind leaps of faith and they want to connect to various things and it's one thing to have a leap of faith that you can take a look at the site and kind of go okay I, I don't like this. It's another thing for a, a device to jump to a, a website and then get some JSON and do it. And so this kind of, I'm a human and I know it when I see it, no longer is valid anymore when we have devices. This is why it's even more generic to IoT type projects. So it, I do feel like this is, in my mind, what is holding back almost any form of connectivity on the web. Yeah, totally. Um, and I know I don't have an answer, I just wanted to kind of bitch with you guys a little bit. Yeah. Uh, also, um, isn't like for me the web is only usable because we have ad blockers and script blockers, yeah. and without that, like yes. it would be completely yes. unusable. But that's so don't, don't you just need that on your phone, maybe, and have it? Well, keep in mind that I see script blockers and ad blockers as just simply just taking the fat pipe and making it more streamlined. Right? You still can go to a fake news site. You can still go to, you know, you, I, mean, yeah, I want to be able to go to any news site and then just type on myself. No, I'm, all I'm like, saying is. I, if I understand you right, you're solving an efficiency problem, and I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out if the site that you go to is reputable or not. Which I, I just think it's a separate problem. <laughs> yeah, I didn't talk about safety. Um, yeah, I mean, I would summarize and say we've we've seen this solved, big and centralized, small and decentralized. Not yet both. Uh, and so yeah, we can not, not I mean, easily go to an open source central DB and have people plug in their own filter list and yeah, we play that. Uh, email gray list I, I think is a prior prior vouches, but it's mostly kind of theory. So so uh, yeah. where do you see the um, the big uh, issue to scale it up from the small? My theory would be that a lot of there's a lot of locality effects around there. So you don't really have to have a global view of anything. It's just a very small subset of the global graph to make. No, you absolutely sense. need a global view to to link from you to any arbitrary URL you get pushed some, from some beacon. That's going to be average seven to fifteen hops. I would if my conjecture that uh, I'm not interested in anything fifteen hops away. But personally, I, I, I may be wrong about that. I haven't done the analysis. You are probably wrong. I mean, you personally, it may be true, but for the average person. 
I think yes, to make this actually like meaningful and useful at all, so that occasionally you do see one and it's good for you. Yeah, it's got to be seven, ten, uh, and twelve. Um, see, see, I'm I'm probably willing to um, not. See. The other problem is we there has never existed like the the big there has never been a truly decentralized social graph. Yes. It never. It's never happened. So I mean, even if we we say that, the way we're going to do it in practice is with something like Facebook. And so I mean, will this be the first big, truly, you know, large-scale decentralized social graph? Yeah. So you know, if, if I look, for example, at how I get my news, just like I get them through Facebook. I think the majority of my news, though, I get through my own social graph of news sites. Yeah. But but again, so Facebook is is maintaining that social graph. But, but, but I'm trying to say that the, the Facebook for me maintains only the small part of the social graph where I get my news from. I maintain the large part of where I get my news from. And in the, in the, in the very bad shape of a bunch of bookmarks. Yeah. But, but that's my social graph for news. Yeah. And so for the very specific use case of you reading news, yeah. that's great. That doesn't solve filtering the physical web. Well, uh, that, that's true because I'm using bookmarks, which is not exactly the right technology for this. Well, the other thing is, I do believe that by making this a generalizable problem and skipping the physical web, we're throwing away an awful lot of the uniqueness the physical web offers. In other words, if we were to upload your geolocation with, like, if you, if I see these eight beacons, and I, if I wipe away a couple or I pick one or two, you were to keep track of that, mm -hmm. you know, say, so people nearby these beacons did or did not use it, right? Just that is actually a pretty strong signal. And so over time... But, but you have a third party that asserts that. Right. Well, but, that, but again, I mean, we're, making tra we're, we're making the algorithm transparent mm -hmm. so that therefore other people can do the exact same thing. And so all I was suggesting is as a V1, we would just simply record usage and just click tracking and just, just literally popularity. But at least by doing it by location, you could, well, that's spoofable, is not a point entirely, you could say you get rid of the farm, the farming aspect of it. You had to actually be at that location to actually have a vote. And again, it's not a, it's, it's a really baby step, giving them a shot. I mean, if we accept that we will do it centralized, there are a ton of different approaches. You know, you can, like, you can say, okay, you prove that you own the address, get some mail there, then you can run a beacon and it will actually trust. I mean, you can imagine a bunch doing it decentralized in the long poll. Um, yeah, and, right. yeah, maybe we do, maybe we don't. Well, one other thing I want to add about, uh, so the case of the museum, uh, where there are you know, spam advertisement beacons in there, um, those are going to be always on, right? Yeah. So it's not just the museum visitors, but the museum staff can go around and they could have a specialized app that knows which of their, you know, knows their beacons and could easily detect any that are unauthorized. Oh, no, absolutely. And they're, they're already talking about having... Uh, wide beam array antennas that help you identify them and take them down. So there's no question that there will be a certain amount of cleanliness that you can do to clean them up. That doesn't make people feel better about the problem because unless you're unbelievably physically vigilant, these things right. can come up. Yeah. Well, the, the, the defense in depth applies. But you can, wouldn't the, the museum also just use one origin, like one domain for all their stuff? So then you could like at the entrance, you could maybe like scan a QR code or have some like welcome like yes. interaction right. to say like, I want to see everything in this museum. Mm -hmm. But you know, museum is a special case for yes. the closed space. Yes, exactly. But, uh, yeah, let's, let's try this office building. Yeah. You know, there are 20 different companies within Bluetooth's uh, beacon range. Now what? <laughs> On the street, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah exactly. And again, if this, if, if this really works, you, there's movable people at conferences and so forth, as, as, you know. So anyway, I, we, we, I, got, we, got to, we got to take a pause. I thank you, by the way, so much. This, this really moved my thinking forward a lot. I do believe it's a hard problem, yeah. and I also believe <laughs> that it's the kind of thing where I kind of want to solve it stupidly. <laughs> In other words, I solved it. I solved. I tackled the physical web problem and discovered a problem. Well, let's just keep that process up. In other words, let's keep prototyping. And, and I, so I do feel like if we could, like, for example, as a, as a possible action item, take this version and revise it to include something along the lines of vouch. Is it enough? Not even close. But it, it allows us to play with it a little bit. And also deliberate. Like, for example, when you get an, an invitation to Mozilla, and the invitation could already say, like, here's the URL that uh, you should trust in the building. And then when you arrive downstairs, you would get the notification from the Mozilla beacon that, like, right. directs you to the office. 
So right I think deliberate interaction is definitely one of the better ones. Right. And you can make it transitive because you know, Mozilla knows that we are registered for this conference, so if we come with our personal beacons, right. there's transitive. But it's the same problem here. The only question is how do you assemble the graph? Right. I think that's a good idea, though. You scan one QR code, and that gives you access to a number of different uh, you know, beacon mm -hmm. authors. It does, yeah, it, 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 for example, it, it, we overlap this then. Let's say, for example, here you are Mozilla vouchers for the attendees in a way here, but in the evening you're going out with some group of friends that has its own way of vouching, and it turns out that one of your friends happens to be in the next room over there in the afternoon. Right now you're overlapping the graphs. So, so, so if you all boils down to a version of this particular graph, the only question is whether you take some of the nodes as specifically vouching nodes and some of the more as cash or acquaintance nodes, but it's the same thing with the graphing. There's going to be a solution that is going to blow us away that we haven't thought of yet. It's <laughs> most likely going to involve decentralized devices. But anyway, so, um, I don't know how much notes are taken. I'm going to try to capture as much as I can. Okay. Well, I, I, I want to follow up on this one. I have a few ideas here. 